Hello, my name is Ian Carroll. I'm the Chief Technical Director at Squirrelington Studios, and I wanted to tell you about the studio that I built by myself with no help besides just asking random mentors. Um, there are no other staff in Squirrelington Studios besides me, and I was able to put together an entire streaming studio. Now, why am I talking about this? Well, uh, I wanted to talk about this presentation for three purposes, and I'm using some notes here, by the way. Um, the first one is to document what I've done so that other people can reproduce it if they so desire, or improve upon it for that matter. Um, I don't want this knowledge to get lost, uh, and I want more people to be able to do what I'm doing right now. The second one is to explain the purposes of the design that I have and why I put together a streaming studio the way that I did. Uh, and the third one is to demonstrate expertise. I know how to put together an entire streaming studio from software all the way through hardware, from glass to glass, I can do the whole thing. Uh, indeed, also the performance. And I believe that more artists should be able to do all of those things, not just perform, not just do the technical, do it all. Uh, is that asking a lot? Maybe, but it also gives you a lot of power because now you are completely vertically integrated yourself. You have the power to create your own art the way that you want to, and nobody can tell you no. Uh, so uh, that's the benefit to doing a system like this. And it requires a very different way of thinking than how we t traditionally think about theater. And maybe I should talk about that first. Um, there are five challenges. Uh, that I see for independent theater in the United States right now. Uh, and this is my own recollection, so I mean, I'm just one guy, but hey, listen to me. Maybe I have something to share. Maybe it's something that you feel too. Uh, one, we need a new process. Uh, why? Because the process that we have is based off of collaborative theater models, based off of about 100 years of tradition, uh, and that is based off of a factory model and also a military model. Uh, both theater and film adopt the same factory and military model uh, in software terms. Because I'm a software engineer during the day, I've taught myself software engineering as well. Yes, I know I'm very smart. That's one of the things I'd like to share with you. But more importantly is what I have to share with you that, you could, be use that could be useful to you. Um, so in software, uh, they discovered that that factory model of command and control where there is a guy at the top, Usually it's a guy, sometimes it's a woman. Um, and then them giving orders to everyone else and then everyone else following those orders uh, isn't a very efficient system. It does provide a great deal of control for the person in authority, uh, but it's not conducive to the kind of art I like to do. Uh, the kind of like art I like to do is called improv theater, narrative improv theater, where we put together an entire play, a whole play, on the spot where we're all co-writing it as we go um, and also performing in it. So uh, if that seems intimidating, uh, that's understandable. Um, and do we create good art? Sometimes we do. Other times it's terrible. But more often than not, it's actually really good. And in fact, it stands up to a lot of things that are done in the traditional command and control waterfall style of uh, creating art. Uh, which is the same style that is used for creating a battleship or a nuclear submarine. Now, that works great for a nuclear submarine um, because of the fact that the parts are known, the physics is known. Um, you're not experimenting as you go. Art is different. Art requires experimentation and risk taking. Uh, the best way to accomplish that is much like how they do it in software teams where you have no one who is a centralized authority figure, simply an objective, and then beyond that objective, uh, the team comes together uh, and they have tools and techniques to do this without anyone being necessarily in charge. Or even if there is someone in charge, it's a very soft position uh, and easy for it to switch around. Um, and uh, by doing that that way, uh, they can experiment and find new and innovative, quicker ways to get things done. Uh, and I think that that's exactly what's necessary for art in, uh, when, when it comes to theater art now. Uh, we should be utilizing and adopting these new ways of working uh, that are also traditional in our own theatrical practices. They're just kind of ignored or put to the sideline. Um, uh, in a new theater. And technology is part of what's going to enable that, which is why I'm sharing with you how to put something like this together. Okay. Um, 
that new process based off of narrative improv, based off of not having a not not having a writer, then followed up by you know trying to get a producer to produce it, and then the producer puts together all those things. We can do this kind of all at once, or a lot closer to all at once. This is much more efficient. Yeah, it's messy, but to be honest, when you do it that traditional way and you try to av avoid those risks of it being messy, what ends up happening is you create just as much bad art. It just costs more and takes longer. So um, uh, this way, uh, you can express yourself directly. And also, you don't have to worry about needing to have permission. Uh, you can directly address uh, your audiences. Um, the other thing is the technical ability to do that, which is what I'm showing you now. So, uh, all right, one is the new process. Two is the technical ability to do that new process, which is what this is. Three is legal ownership of the stuff that you are creating and how to organize that. I have uh, a legal agreement called the SPACA, which is designed specifically for dealing with community ownership of the art that is created by a bunch of artists where everyone is treated equitably. Uh, normally in contracts, one person predominates and everyone else is forced to sign because of that. Uh, this new model is designed around the idea that everyone should be equals regardless. Um, yes, maybe some powerful people wouldn't like that. Um, however, if you're a new artist or you'd like to experiment uh, or you just like friendship, then uh, this would be a great thing to try. All right, so one, new process. Two, technical ability. Three, legal ownership. Four is community building. Um, I haven't done a great job of community building. I think I piss people off. Um, I think that uh, my ideas seem confusing and weird and uh, people don't expect it and so they don't trust it. Um, and because of that, it is very hard for me to build uh, a community necessary in order to do this. There are people who do it really, really well. I would like to mention Matt Pittner. Uh, at Outside In, uh, and also Paul Hungerford, same thing. Um, uh, there are numerous others who are community leaders, uh, usually found in small communities. Bridge Improv is doing a really excellent job of this, by the way, and I think The Ledge also does a really good job of cultivating a community. Uh, so there are theaters that do this and that are experts at it. I'm not a good expert at this yet, uh, but that is something that's necessary. And the last one is distribution. Okay, distribution. So, right now, why not say, well, why not just stream on YouTube or on Facebook or on uh, Twitch or whatever the platform is? The answer to that is that each of those platforms are opinionated about what content goes onto them. Yes, anyone can stream on Twitch. They have uh, community guidelines around what you can put up on Twitch. Uh, for example, Twitch. Um, but the problem is that even though they allow you to do this, their entire UI, their user interface, is designed around selling games. And that's exactly how they make their money, is people watching streams, buying games, trying to stream themselves on the platform also. And so that relationship between Twitch and the game companies is what creates uh, that, that model working that well. If you're not selling games, then it doesn't, ha you're not gonna get any support and you're not gonna get any traction. And I've seen this happen again and again in theater where someone tries to stream on Twitch and yeah, you can do it. You're never gonna get an audience. And if you do, it's just gonna get eroded onto the rest of the platform, which by the way is YouTube's problem. So why is it that we can't stream theater on YouTube? Um, and the answer is because the thing that works on YouTube is a YouTube video. Why? Because the platform is so specific around how you compete and interact with your audiences that the only kind of video that will work on YouTube is one that's specifically designed for YouTube. That doesn't help theater. Theater doesn't do well on YouTube. So we need a new platform. Maybe Vimeo, maybe we could use that for a while. Eventually we're going to need to build our own user interface. Uh, and when we do, I would like one to be accessible to everybody uh, rather than simply Broadway platforms and things like that. Um, so I'm going to be working on that as well uh, one day. Uh, I know how I'm going to design it, uh, but uh, I'm not there yet. So those are the five challenges I see. One, a new process based off of narrative improvisation. By the way, I should mention uh, narrative improvisation uh, comes from uh, a lot of traditions. I need to mention Keith Johnstone, of course. Uh, Impro Theater, Outside In, um, uh, Hideout, 
uh, I think Bridge Improv also does a little bit of this. Um, and uh, there are a lot of places that do. Uh, it is a transformative kind of theater, almost like guerrilla theater a little bit, or uh, theater of the oppressed. Um, so uh, those are things that this technology is designed to support. All right, let me get back into these five challenges again. Again, the five challenges are one, a new process. Two, technical ability to create with that new process in mind. Three is the legal ownership. Four is the community building. And five is the distribution. So with those things, we can actually create a community theater, a democratic theater uh, that has never really been seen in the United States, but really I believe it is uh, an American theater. Um, and uh, one that is based off of the ideals of free speech and equality. Uh, there are numerous other things out there as well, but this is what I'm trying to build. And if that's something that's interesting to you as well, uh, then uh, even if you're not in America, um, uh, then I welcome you to uh, continue watching. I realize that I've rambled a bit, so I'm just gonna try to get straight to some of the technical things that I've done. All right, here we go. So the first thing I want to talk about is the space that you need. Uh, first, you're gonna need storage space uh, for all the equipment that you're currently not fielding on the stage. Um, that uh, needs probably about uh, 50 square feet of storage space. I recommend you have that storage space nearby. Uh, and also that you put the things that you're most often needing near the front so that you can access them uh, quickly. Uh, there's going to be stuff that you access more and stuff that you access less. Put the things that you access less further away. Put the things that you need more often up front. And if that starts changing, just start switching things around. Okay, besides the organization of that, it's also a really good idea to have an inventory uh, of your equipment. Know precisely what equipment you have. Every time that you buy a piece of equipment, write down what it is, how much it costs, the website, where it came from, and uh, that's pretty much all you need. Uh, for tax reporting reasons, that's a good idea too. So you might want to put that in two different places. One is an inventory and one is for tax reporting. Um, so uh, that's one thing. Uh, then after that uh, comes the actual performance and recording space. Uh, so the re recording space, um, you need um, more than what I'm doing. My first thought was try to put it into an apartment's living room. Turns out an apartment living room is not big enough to allow for good streaming theater. Uh, you need a larger space than that. Um, probably 20 by 20 at least for the performance area and probably more so that an audience can get in and people can move in and out of the space. Uh, so um, you will need a space. If you don't have a space, that's okay. Uh, what I've done personally is not have a space and I have built my equipment so that it can be portable. Everything here can be taken down and pulled back up uh, someplace else. Um, now. Uh, when it comes to uh, the equipment, uh, let's talk about uh, rigging. The first thing is that you want that rigging to be as sturdy as possible. Now, what I do is I have poles, right? And these are on tripods, and they connect I-beams across the edges of the space. Now, you could go with a grid uh, that is by plumbing poles and try to screw those directly into your your house uh, or whatever building it is. If you do that, make sure that you're not screwing things into plumbing. They'll look the same on a stud finder, whether it is um, a sewage line or uh, a beam that you can attach things to. So be very careful about that. I've heard horror stories where someone has um, installed um, a grid and one of the pipes that they installed it into was the sewage line and the whole studio was covered in, well, shit. So uh, don't do that. Um, it's a smarter idea to have a lower impact, much like camping. So 
by using tripods, even though they take up a little bit more room in the space. So you're going to need a little bit more space if you're going to use these. Um, it actually allows you to set up and tear down more quickly. Another thing that's important to note is that you should be using sandbags at the bottom of each of your tripods, and you should be putting some sort of padding uh, between the tripod foot and the flooring so that you don't end up scratching it over time uh, and you can leave the site as pristine as you found it. Uh, another thing to note is that you should be managing your cables really, really effectively. So please tie up your cables carefully. All of these things are things that like a tech would know to do because you know loose cables are a problem because one, they get confusing and two, they're a tripping hazard. Uh, and when you got performers and when you're performing, you don't want to be thinking about where the cables are. You want to be thinking about your performance. So. Do yourself the favor, take the time ahead of time to actually manage the cables really well. Keep them neat, tidy, uh, make sure that you label what's what. Um, uh, another thing you should note uh, is having uh, emergency equipment on site. So uh, definitely have a fire extinguisher, uh, definitely have a first aid kit, um, as much as you can afford. Uh, it's not very expensive to do that. So, I mean, this is gonna require a budget. Um, Speaking of which, I should mention the budget. So, um, uh, a theater space like this is going to cost you, in the end, about the same as a luxury car. Uh, maybe a high-end luxury car. Um, somewhere between $80,000 and $120,000 is probably what it's going to end up costing you to build things in a way where it's quality uh, and it does all the, uh, the things that both a theater and a studio need. Um, so uh, that's another thing to consider. Um, all right, what else to talk about with this? Um, oh yeah, when you're hanging lights, please be very careful about uh, what, how uh, uh, hanging heavy things high up. Uh, if they fall off or break or, or swing down or there's an earthquake, there are earthquakes in California, um, or other kinds of um, uh, natural, uh, natural phenomena, uh, that happened that could disrupt the studio's operation. Uh, please keep those in mind. Keep safety in mind. Use safety cables. Uh, use um, uh, strong connections and make sure that everything is solid and that you're only putting things on places where you know it can support the weight. Um, all right. That being said, there are things that you screw into the walls. Um, now, I have avoided using piping, screwing that right into the walls for the reasons that I just described. I don't know where the pipes are in here, and I could accidentally create damage. Uh, but it's fine to put up curtains. Uh, so the curtains that you see back here uh, are all over this room. Uh, but before we put up the curtains, uh, you need to sound treat the room. Uh, and how you can sound treat a room is by using that acoustic foam and do two things. One, put acoustic foam across the ceiling. So the sound will bounce off the floor, hit the ceiling, and then it'll stop there. But uh, if you, uh, ideally, like in a perfect sound studio, you would have a, a, a soft floor as well, but that won't work for actors, uh, and it won't work for dancers or performers. Uh, you need a, a nice, solid floor to work on, and that is going to bounce sound off of, so accept that. Uh, there is going to be some amount of active noise in the room because of those things. Uh, you can correct for that, but actually I kind of like the sound of a little bit of reverb in the room. As such, besides acoustic foaming the entire ceiling, get the area where a person is speaking. So about head height. So if they kneel down or they stand up on their toes, get that area too, but it should be like a, a, a band around the room. Um, and that band is going to muffle a lot of the sound. The rest of it can be exposed. You have windows, sure, I got windows in here. Um, uh, that, that's going to reflect sound, but uh, because of the fact that you've covered the walls, uh, it won't affect the sound as much. All right, another thing to uh, make sure that you do is set up before you've, as you're setting up this, this stuff. So first the acoustic foam, then uh, put up the curtains. Um, actually, no. First the acoustic foam, then you want to put up your house lights. Uh, the house lights should be on a completely different circuit uh, than your uh, actual studio lights. Um, house lights are really good just in the corners. 
if you've got a little bit of uh, white space that you can bounce some light off of, it's perfect for that. Um, and you want those house lights to be different from your studio lights because the house lights are going to be used for you to uh, set up equipment and move things around uh, and to work and set up the space. The studio lights are when you light a subject uh, and or you light a performance. Uh, and that is different. So the house lights don't need to be interactive. Uh, you can just put them on a switch. Um, and uh, also, I should mention that it's a good idea for you to use all LED lights. Why? Because LED lights are uh, much less power consumptive than traditional lights. OK, but there are lots of people who love tungsten lights. Yes, I know. Tungsten lights have this beautiful, rich color in person. When you film them, it looks washed out. Um, and it looks like you're underneath a street lamp. Um, and that's not OK. Uh, so uh, using LED lights, and specifically use LED lights that have a high CRI. Uh, the CRI is going to be how much color gets transmitted after bouncing off of objects uh, from that light. Um, and that's going to allow your cameras to pick up more color. Um, a balancing point for this uh, is to use LED lights that have um, as low, uh, as, as hot a light as you can get. Uh, what I mean by that is there are warm and cool lights. Um, so warm lights are going to be more yellow, cool lights are going to be more blue. Uh, LEDs tend to be more blue in general. So if you can get ones that have a lower warm, a more extreme warm on them as well, that helps. Use bicolor LEDs. Uh, bicolor LEDs um, are uh, have two different colors, a very warm and a very cool, and they blend between the two of them to make whatever shade that you need. By using bicolor LEDs, you actually get two, uh, two lights in one. Um, you can set them anywhere in between, and now you don't need to worry about gels. People have experimented with using um, uh, RGB LEDs, red, green, blue, thinking that red, green, and blue creates any color that you can imagine. That gives you the whole gamut. In theory, yes. Uh, in practice, it creates weird shades of, 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 of pink and fuchsia on, or, and blue on everything. Uh, it's because of the balance between those colors. So you need both bicolor LEDs to light a person's face, and then you need RGB LEDs to do backlights and also curtain lights. Um, now, uh, you're going to be combining two different styles of, um, uh, of, of lighting techniques. One is the studio lighting technique, uh, which is a three-point light. So you want a key, a fill, I think I've got this reversed for me, um, a, key, a key, a fill, and then a backlight to light the subject. In addition to that, you also need curtain lights uh, to light the background that the person is in, so they're not just isolated completely. Uh, with those three, and if you put them onto a uh, DMX plot, um, all, those, all these lights, then you can control dynamically the mood of a, of a performance, which allows the tech to become an improviser along with the other improvisers, another storyteller. In fact, that's exactly what the tech should be. And in traditional filmmaking, that's exactly what a cinematographer and all of the different camera assistants are, uh, and the sound person. They're all artists, and they're all making artistic choices around what uh, the story is going to be. Uh, so uh, the idea of doing improv filmmaking, which sounds like chaos, and it is, um, can be done. Uh, you think differently about how people play what roles and how all this stuff comes together. Um, so, um, and in order to do that, you would need um, for improv filmmaking uh, a number of people who are skilled at everything. Um, does that mean that they don't create the most masterful shot? Yeah, there are mistakes that are made. And you know what? Mistakes are part of art. We do the best that we can. We hone our craft. We hone everything that we have to make as few mistakes as possible. But an art without any mistakes is dead. So it's fine, I think, especially if you've got the equipment and there's no producer demanding perfection. Uh, you don't need that. Um, so uh, getting back to the uh, lights, 
Um, yeah, you will need to think about those two things. So you'll need bicolor LEDs to light your subjects, and then you will need RGB LEDs, which may include other values besides RG and B, um, to uh, create moods and effects. Uh, for RGB LEDs, uh, I recommend ADJ. Um, American DJ. Uh, those lights work really well and they're inexpensive. Uh, there is a slight downside to them is that they're not rated for film, which means that they can flicker. Uh, so uh, consider that, but if you have uh, uh, lights that, are, that have DMX control and then also um, are uh, rated for film, then you have uh, lights that can light the subject that will not flicker, uh, and that's the important thing. So make sure that the lights that you're using on your subjects are really nice lights. Now that doesn't mean buy the most expensive light. Uh, in fact, you can get most of the lights, the lights that I have are all around 400 to $600 each light, uh, which is actually pretty inexpensive. Uh, it's certainly affordable uh, for a single person who has a, a, a nice software job can afford to do this in the course of about two or three years. Um, assembling these pieces one by one, starting with the ones that are the most necessary. Probably you want the sound and the camera to start. And then after that, you can start dealing with lights. Um, and then besides the sound and the camera, there's also the ability to stream. Uh, so um, all of these things, uh, let's, let's actually start talking about the camera itself now. So I've rolled into shot a camera. This is low in the shot. That's okay. Let's slowly spin this up. All right. And you can see how this looks. Now you go, wow, that's a big camera. Eh, yeah, it is. Okay, so this right here is a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 6K camera. Uh, they don't make these anymore. Uh, they make a better model now, so it's the same price. Um, the key thing is to get a camera body, camera cage. You'll want uh, follow focus, uh, and I use Tilta for my follow focus. Uh, you, the, the newest one uh, right here, uh, the one that they sell now, is now good enough to operate both the zoom and also the focus. Uh, so just get those. You don't need to get the, the older one. Uh, but if you see the older one out there for a lower price point, great. It'll work for the focus only. Um, uh, in addition to that, uh, you're also going to need a battery pack. So the battery back here um, should power the unit for about three hours. Um, and that's what you're going to be looking for. In this case, I'm using a HyperCore Neo Slim 90 kilowatt. Um, and that is doing a, a very nice job and it does a great job for these cameras. If you wanted to um, uh, do a marathon, you would need to buy enough batteries and enough chargers so that you could swap these in and out as you went through it. But you'd need to do that about once every three hours. So probably you'd need about three or four batteries per camera in order to accomplish that, plus the charging equipment. Um, so, uh, the camera, uh, I've, I've displayed this before, uh, lens, you're going to need, uh, photographic lenses work okay. So, uh, and that's what I'm using right now, are photographic Canon lenses. Uh, you could use cinema lenses, um, uh, but, uh, these photographic lenses work well enough and they're, uh, they're going to retain their value quite well. In time, you can upgrade. Um, uh, the, uh, the camera body, uh, you want it to be at least able to stream out in 1080p. Uh, for the newer ones, you probably should be looking for one that can stream out in 4K. Um, speaking of which, uh, and eventually you're going to get to 8K. After 8K, I don't know if we're going to need to move to 16K or anything else like that. So that's probably going to be the limit because the human eye can only see so much uh, and 8K is about the limit where you, you don't really notice very much of a difference between 8 and 16K. You do notice a difference between uh, 4 and 8K, and you definitely notice a difference between 1080p and, 4, and 4K. So uh, consider that. That was my phone going off. Uh, anyway, um, this over here is the Teradec. The Teradec 
is a wireless transmitter. Teradex are very expensive, uh, and they're also finicky. Uh, so consider this. But this is the only transmitter I found that actually works well enough to reliably uh, broadcast so that the entire unit is hands-free. Uh, now, with the battery included and the Teradec, it means that I can pick up this whole camera, and if I want to, um, I can film, uh, I, I, can, I can do uh, cinematic or handheld effects because of the fact that the camera doesn't have any cords attached to it. That's one less safety problem uh, and one less thing to go wrong. Uh, however, it creates a number of things that also can go wrong, so you need to understand radio frequencies, uh, and in RF interference, the channels these are operating on, uh, but once and, and the settings of these units. And it takes a while to sort of figure out how this works. Once you do, though, uh, the unit works brilliantly. Uh, and I haven't had trouble with it after I have uh, found the right set of settings. Okay, so I've talked about that. Same thing goes with the camera, by the way. Uh, as you're working with one of these, you will need to know how a camera works. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, the camera on your cell phone, uh, by the way, um, it's doing a lot of work for you, and it's making a lot of assumptions about how you want to film. Uh, and, yeah, you could use uh, phone cameras, I guess. Uh, the quality's going to be terrible, and you're not going to get the shot that you actually want. Uh, it's going to give you the shot that uh, a team of products people came together and thought, what does an average person want? They're not thinking about somebody who's trying to create art. Um, this camera right here, uh, you want to control uh, you, you, any camera that you get. You want it to be able to control the ISO, uh, which is a sensitivity of the sensor. You need to control the f-stop, which is the aperture of the lens, and that's going to change things too. Uh, and then the third thing is the shutter speed. Um, and the shutter speed is going, like, generally I keep the shutter speed at precisely the same as whatever the, um, uh, the film is. That seems to work okay. So frames per second. So if the frame per second is 30, which this one is, uh, then I would do a shutter speed of 30 as well. Um, if you do faster than that, it starts to look kind of, uh, it's, it's interesting. Uh, experiment. See what, that, see what that does. Um, uh, but besides that, um, Okay, so we got these things talked about. Um, camera cage, uh, make sure that this camera is secure. Um, this unit right here, all together, is probably going to cost about $7,000. All kitted out completely. The whole thing, including the tripod. Uh, and that creates an entire unit. Now, this Teradec transmits, along with the other ones, to a broadcast uh, um, uh, point. Uh, and that's what I do is I set up a broadcast point that then takes those signals and brings them into a camera switcher. That camera switcher then uh, is able to um, uh, show you all the different shots that you have. So you can live edit using that uh, either um, for live streaming or if you want to do a quick quick and dirty prototype of, uh, of, of the performance that you're doing. Um, both of those will be very effective for that. Uh, that that camera switcher then gets plugged into a very nice computer. And that very nice computer uh, it streams that camera shot along with everything else on OBS. Uh, note uh, that because of the fact that the video and the audio are going to come in on different angles, they can be drift, there can be drift, or there can be uh, a lack of sync because uh, the camera might be like 78 milliseconds behind or something like that. So you might need to tweak that uh, as you set up your system and tune it the right way. Uh, so keep that in mind. Let's talk about sound. Sound is more important than cameras. Uh, sound um, is uh, what I use are two uh, area mics um, that are Deity S Mic Pros. Um, uh, and these are shotgun mics. Um, so I point one in one direction, one in the other. Uh, I put these onto a tripod and attach the recorder uh, with everything that's necessary onto that. And it kind of looks like a crab, so I call it the sound crab. Uh, it's one of the weird little innovations I've created. You can pick up this whole sound thing and just move it around. Uh, and you don't have to worry about so many wires. And usually what I do is I set that low 
uh, and point it upwards at the performers. That seems to catch pretty good sound. Um, uh, there are ways to do it better. You could do wireless labs. That's going to be much more expensive. The sound crap's probably going to cost you about five thousand dollars when you put it all together. Um, the um, uh, uh, doing a lab setup is going to cost you about three to four thousand dollars per channel, and if you've got twelve performers, that adds up pretty quickly. Twelve times four, forty-eight thousand, something like that. Um, Anyway, um, yeah, uh, math, uh, I'm a theater major. Uh, math is not my strong suit, but I do enough math to be able to do this. Um, all right, uh, when you're doing audio, make sure to record uh, at at least 24 bits um, and at 48 uh, kilohertz. Uh, that's broadcast quality. Um, uh, it's better if you can do 32, but 32 will still peak uh, in live performances. So uh, add a limiter uh, to the top of it so that it doesn't peak. Uh, so then you don't get those weird little crunchy noises uh, when people speak too loud. Uh, or, you know, they have their plosives. Um, so uh, that will help with that. Uh, because of the fact that the sound crab is also wireless and completely free as well, you could suspend it from a grid. You can move it in various places. Uh, and uh, that seems to be a good beginning place. The key thing to remember about sound equipment is to try to, at first, keep all the caps as close as possible to each other. Uh, and that's because as someone speaks, if someone is near this mic and further away from this one, this mic's going to pick it up a few milliseconds before this one does, and then you're going to get this weird sort of phasey echo thing going on until they get here, and that's fine. And then they get it again when it comes over here. So watch out for that. Uh, there are ways to compensate for that, of course. Um, you know, uh, more audio engineering. Uh, but uh, to be honest, the sound crab does a pretty good job. Uh, so uh, that uh, seems to be pretty effective, um, combined with some live, uh, live mixing and things like that, just to clean it up a little bit. Uh, same thing goes with cameras, by the way, uh, cleaning up the image. Uh, you can clean it up in OBS using LUTs, uh, so you can actually get the same sort of color-corrected, perfect look from a produced video uh, by using a LUT if you know exactly how the lighting is going to be, which you have complete control of because you bought the lights. So, um, speaking of lights, I should have mentioned earlier that uh, lights use electricity. So, uh, when you are designing your lights, Consider the circuits in the room that you're going to use. Um, a circuit can take about 12 amps of power draw before uh, it, uh, it, it starts tripping things um, and then shutting down your lights. Um, so uh, definitely consider keeping any one circuit and know where the circuits are. Um, you can do that by actually going to um, the, uh, the circuit breaker and just hitting different ones and seeing which lights come off and, and which ones stay on. Um, there are other ways to do that too. Uh, if you have blueprints or something like that, maybe that'll help. Um, but to be honest, you know, actually finding out is, is the best way. Um, do some math about the power draw of each of those lights in amps. Once you figure out that, you can tell whether or not uh, you have overloaded a circuit. Um, and you'll need to do that because I've seen it happen plenty of times where, you know, a theater will load too many lights onto one circuit and randomly during a performance, there won't be any lights. That's no good. So uh, definitely do the math ahead of time. Uh, and, you know, if necessary, consult an electrician. Um, I happen to have a cousin who is one and uh, he's great. And so he told me about this and really it's just saved my butt. And also the theaters I work with. So, um, all right. So we've talked about the cameras, we've talked about the storage, we've talked about how to organize things, we've talked about um, uh, how to uh, set up uh, the equipment, how to manage the cables. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit more about cameras uh, and then some more things about further reading. So if you don't have the budget for a uh, $7,000 camera, you, while you're saving up for that, you can buy a $2,000 uh, Canon camcorder. These are used uh, for electronic news gathering uh, professionally. Um, so uh, these are fine, and it's a complete unit all encased in one thing. It does everything the other one did, except for the transmitter, 
uh, you will need to either get a transmitter or you can actually uh, attach an SDI cable and have one cable uh, that works with this. Use an SDI cable, not an HDMI. Most of these have an HDMI out port, so you're going to need an HDMI out, short one, followed by using a Blackmagic um, uh, SDI converter, which you will need to power separately. Uh, so that's going to rig that a little bit. Uh, you can use a uh, cell phone battery pack. Um, you know, one of those, um, you know, uh, extra cell phone batteries. Those work great uh, for this kind of little piece of equipment that needs a little bit of extra power. Uh, maybe use gaff tape. You're, you might find some other way to attach things the right way. Be safe. Use good cable management. Uh, or, and, and then you would snake that around the room until you get to uh, the uh, video switcher. You're going to need another Blackmagic um, uh, converter to convert that SDI cable back into an HDMI so that the uh, uh, video switcher can use it. So um, instead of the Teradec, which costs anywhere somewhere around $1,500 a piece, uh, that would cost you about $100 for the cable, and then another $200 for the two converters. Uh, that's $300, and then you're going to need those those uh, those battery packs. It's probably going to be another $50, somewhere around $350 uh, of additional equipment. Uh, so for the whole thing, um, tripod uh, is going to be another $500, so that's $850 in addition to this. Uh, each camera can cost you uh, this way. Um, about uh, $3,000 a piece. Um, and that's pretty good. Um, and when it's time, you still have the Teradec and you still have uh, the SDI cables uh, if you're using that instead. Uh, and you still have the tripod, those will all still work on your new camera setup. The rest of it you'll need to buy out. Uh, and maybe what you do is you buy out these ones and then you slowly replace them one at a time. Oh, here's another thing to consider. Um, the number of cameras to get. Generally speaking, people choose three. I choose four. Why four? Because you need the coverage for the three. There's a left, a right, and a center, right? Um, and that gives you like sitcom style film coverage. Uh, the fourth camera can be used for getting all those cinematographic artsy kinds of shots. Also, I've had situations where a camera will, will, will fall over. Now, that, that's only happened to me once. It broke the camera. Um, and when it did, we only had two cameras left. Filming with two cameras and trying to broadcast with two is much harder than trying to do it with three. It's possible. Um, but um, if you have one extra, then even if something goes horrifyingly wrong with one of your cameras, which this is uh, all hardware equipment and it can, uh, you still have uh, a set of three that gives you uh, really good coverage. Um, also, it is a good idea to have backup cameras around, such as your older cameras that you got first. And also consider uh, a photographic camera. This is quite a lens on this camera. Uh, it's an old um, Konica. Um, and I'm pretty sure that my dad used this lens to take pictures of me as a baby. Um, still useful, just needs an adapter. Um, but uh, with using going out and taking shots with a regular camera and then uh, using the same digital camera, an inexpensive one, don't, don't, don't go out, all, all out on this. Uh, just make sure that you can control the ISO, you can control the shutter speed, you can control the aperture. Uh, the aperture is on the lens, so it should be okay for that. Um, uh, and uh, with that, you can start to learn all the little details about how to frame things, what's your aesthetic. Um, so that's a really good idea. And also, um, the, uh, the streaming capability of this camera, it, you know, it, it can serve as a backup camera for you. Uh, okay. Let me talk about, um, there is another thing to talk about besides the camera switcher and the lighting board which, you know, uh, being able to dynamically control the lights is great. Um, uh, having a soundboard as well is useful for mixing the sound. Uh, you can do that in software or you can use a hardware board as well. Um, both of them have their benefits and drawbacks. Uh, probably best to start with software and then start moving towards hardware. Um, uh, as long as you have a beefy enough computer, you're going to need a very, very 
very sturdy computer. Uh, make sure that the computer that you're using is one that's good enough for playing really, really high-end video games. If it can do that, then it does everything that you need. It can also put together your videos. It can stream those videos out. It has enough uh, memory, compute power, and bandwidth uh, to be able to do that. When you stream out, make sure that you use a CAT6 cable. The CAT6 cable is much more reliable than using Wi-Fi. The less wireless things that you do, the better. I know that I was using wireless cameras before. I know that I use wireless audio. That's because the, the, the benefit to allowing those cameras to be completely free outweighs the drawback of having to use wireless. Uh, but Wi-Fi is unreliable um, at best. Uh, so instead, use an actual cable. Uh, the cables are not very expensive. Cat, cable, Cat 6 cables are really cheap. Uh, you can usually just take that and put it right into your router. Uh, if you have a, a router that only has a single um, uh, spot for a Cat 6 cable, consider getting a, uh, like a cheap wireless router to go with it uh, and plug it into that. It's going to take a little bit of time to switch it, but at least you know, that way you get your cable out. Uh, it's going to make a much more reliable connection. Um, and some other things. Um, with the uh, studio that you have, uh, that is with the sort of control center, um, your operations node, like a little desk, um, that area needs to be something that can roll. Uh, so putting it on rollers and making sure that it's well balanced enough for that is really good. Uh, manage all the cables there because that desk ends up becoming like a whole electronics thing itself as all the wires that go this way, that way. Uh, manage those effectively and take the time to do that ahead of time. Uh, I like to use the same uh, mounting tape that I use for mounting um, the, um, the acoustic foam. I use that same mounting tape to mount uh, the, uh, the power converters from the, the monitors and things like that. Um, underneath the desk. Uh, and I'll put two sandbags on that desk, uh, at, at the feet of the desk too, to help counterweight it so that it doesn't tip over or anything else like that. And putting the whole thing on wheels means that you can reconfigure your space. So you can turn uh, a small space into essentially a convertible black box uh, as you need, um, which is great. So uh, yes. That cable and then the other cable that needs to be attached to that is power. And it's probably a good idea to attach the power strip to the desk uh, and then wire everything into that. Uh, if you're using a standing desk like I do, it means that you can lower that desk so that the monitors are beneath where your eye line is so you can see the performers and also work on your equipment at the same time. That's a big plus. Another nice thing to have is if you have monitors that can swing out. Uh, by having a monitor that swings out, you can also use that as a vanity um, or as uh, another way of giving feedback. Uh, in addition to allowing that monitor to stream out, you can also create a little closed circuit stream within the area. So you can link that same cable using SDI cables again um, out to another area where an audience might be sitting and watching the monitor feed directly. Um, or you can show that to, to anybody you know, for, um, uh, for, for theater who is waiting in the wings and can't see what's going on on the stage. Um, so uh, lots of use cases for that. Uh, also, because of the fact that this is sitting inside of the studio area, you can light that, uh, that command station and do some filming in there too, if you so desire. Um, so, I mean, like, really, uh, the opportunities and the options are limitless if you build this thing in a way where you can dynamically control what you need when you need it. Basically, the entire studio setup, from the lights to the cameras to the sound equipment to the uh, streaming uh, data center that you've created, all of this is an instrument of art. And it is all one instrument, which means that you need to be able to access the things that you need to, to access for the art purposes quickly. And all the other things, you want them to not be distracting you. Uh, and that is the design purpose behind building a studio this way. Um, uh, an additional thing that you should consider is uh, storage of videos. Now, a 1080p video that's produced is not going to take up all that much room. You don't have to worry too much about keeping that. But what happens when you've got 100 videos 
that each camera has recorded in 6K, uh, where each camera, is, that, that recording is 700 gigabytes, each one of them for a 90 minute video. Uh, you're talking about four terabytes, a little less than four terabytes worth of data uh, to control the raw footage. That's a lot. Uh, so you might need to consider using a uh, network, uh, a NAS, a network accessed storage, uh, basically a big bunch of hard drives. Uh, and uh, now you're getting into something for network engineering. Uh, if you do that. The other option is to try to store it with AWS. Uh, you can send it out over the, uh, over, over the airwaves that way, or over the internet, I should say. Um, and they'll store it for you for a cost, um, and you'll be paying that cost forever every single month. Um, that's not really a sustainable practice, but maybe at the beginning, which is what I'm doing right now, is just um, streaming out uh, the raw footage that I want into an S3 bucket in AWS uh, and using their lowest tier cost point, uh, which is a, um, uh, a Glacier, uh, S3 Glacier, um, to make it as less, least expensive as possible. It ends up costing me about $8 a month forever. It never goes away. It'll only ever go up as I create more things. So it's better to use network access storage. So that will be a next stage uh, for, for this, is when you start dealing with network engineering. And at that point, you start to deal with IP-based broadcast facilities, which is basically combining all the things from the internet and all the things from video and audio production, uh, and then combining that and, and, attack, and, and, and attaching that to a theatrical instrument. Um, uh, and it can be done. Uh, the knowledge is there. It's just a question of assembling it. Uh, and it would take some time to do it, but it would be worth it to do it. And I've already done it, so it is worth it, I think. Uh, let me talk about some books. All right. When it comes to process, here are the books that I really like. One is Impro by Keith, Keith Johnstone. Uh, great for understanding the theoretical beginnings of uh, improvisation. Uh, in addition to that, using uh, Suzuki and viewpoints uh, uh, are both very powerful techniques and can be used uh, with this kind of a setup. In addition to that, since we're dealing with the internet and we can get feedback, uh, if we design it the right way, interactive acting uh, by, uh, I know Jeff Wirth personally, uh, he's great. Um, and uh, this book is a great basis for understanding how to uh, interact with the audience in a way where they feel engaged. If you're doing improvisation, you can totally do that. Um, another one is Factory of One. Uh, this is a book about lean manufacturing for an individual putting things together themselves. Um, this is a great book for just keeping yourself organized. And you will need to keep yourself organized if you're building a studio like this. Um, the idea that I'm an artist, I don't need to be organized. That's bullshit. Uh, that's actually classist and privileged bullshit. Um, so you do need to be organized. You are an artist. It doesn't mean that you don't do math. Enough of that. Okay. Besides that, a factory of one for lean manufacturing. You also might consider the lean startup um, uh, for understanding how to think about uh, creating and pivoting um, uh, art on the go with a, with with a bunch of people where you don't know exactly where you're going or how you're getting there, and you should definitely read the Agile Manifesto, um, which is perfect to go along with both improv and also uh, this new way of uh, creating storytelling. Um, after all, all the equipment that you're you're dealing with is probably been developed in one way or another using Agile methodologies. Um, uh, and especially the software has. Uh, any of the software that hasn't, you can feel it when it hasn't. Uh, it's got a bunch of useless features. It tries to convince you that you're the wrong one when in fact it's designed badly. Um, yeah, I have, I have opinions about that. I'm not gonna mention them here. Um, all right, other things for the arts. Uh, consider In the Blink of an Eye. Uh, this is going to be a great foundational uh, text for understanding uh, the philosophy around how and why you edit. So when you're doing live editing, this is a great book to think about, um, about what editing does for storytelling. 
Speaking of that, visual storytelling, uh, this is a coffee table book and it is perfect for giving you everything that you need to know about how cameras work and what the effect is when you do one thing versus another. This allows you as the camera operator to uh, help create the story along with the performers. Uh, so that's another great one. Uh, more books, more books. Oh my God, so many books. Um, all right, so uh, if you want to understand how video uh, is encoded online, uh, Decode to Encode is going to help you out a lot. And this is also a great book for understanding how uh, ones and zeros get turned into a picture. And you're going to need to know that in order to operate with this equipment, uh, or at least it's extremely useful knowledge. Uh, so definitely read that at some point. FFmpeg um, uh, for converting videos to, from, from one source to another, uh, which means that you're also going to need to know about the command line on, uh, on a computer. Uh, and uh, you're probably going to need to know about some things involving network engineering and software engineering, those sort of things, and understand, knowing your way around a computer. Um, but this will allow you to easily convert from one version, one file to another. Uh, highly technical, uh, but very, very useful. Um, another one. You're not going to use everything in this book, and it's a big, fat, fat thick one. Uh, the SBE Broadcast Engineering Handbook. Um, However, all the information here is very good to know uh, because it tells you about how to set up studios and how to design things uh, and the, and the trade-offs and also how to operate and how to maintain and also what can go wrong. And it also deals with broadcast towers and exactly how a broadcast works. By the way, the way digital broadcasting works is brilliant, breathtakingly brilliant. It's beautiful. I wish the internet was so uh, robust for signal strength as uh, a digital signal is uh, for TV. Dang, awesome. Um, uh, network Plus is going to be something good for understanding network engineering. Uh, if we're going into an IP-based workflow, then uh, it's a very good idea for you to understand exactly how networks work. In addition to that, knowing about packet analysis. If you don't know what a packet is, you need to read that other book first. Uh, and that's understandable. Uh, but this is a very powerful thing to have as well. There's a lot of things that you need to learn in order to do this. And I swear it is possible because I've done it. And I am not, I mean, OK, fine. Uh, there, there are circumstances around my life that make this particularly useful. But when I started, I did not know anything about maths. I was told in theater school that, you know, if you don't like theater, you should go to the accounting department. Accounting is extremely useful for theater professionals. Um, and um, uh, uh, how computers work, very useful to, to, to a theater artist. How, um, uh, how camera equipment works and sound equipment and recording and, uh, and editing. That's also very important. Uh, and then also, um, you know, all the, all the other kinds of engineering things. These are all really important for artists. I've managed to, to, since then, teach myself all these things. And I know that others can do it because I did it too. You do need some calm focus time. Uh, but there are plenty of times in my life where I had just nothing going on and no one calling. And if I don't have that, then I can use that time productively, and I did. I built an entire studio. Um, so uh, this is documenting how this all works. And this video is not going to be perfectly produced. It's rambly, and I'm sorry it's rambly. I'm really sorry about that. I'm trying to put it together off the cuff uh, because I got other things I need to do as well. But at the same time, I want to share this. So um, if this is interesting to you, uh, if you'd like to work with me, I'm very happy to work with you. I uh, will teach anything I know. Um, if you want to work with me artistically, uh, I also teach whatever I know in addition to, to, to uh, working on this equipment. Um, uh, and uh, if you are interested in just doing it yourself, please, by all means, please, 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 go out and create art. Um, and that's ultimately the purpose I have in doing all of this. So. Oh, that's pretty much everything I can think of. Did I miss anything? I think not. I think that's it. Okay.
cool. Well, in that case, best of luck to you. Break legs. Don't break equipment. Um, and um, uh, hopefully I get to work with you someday. <laughs>